Okay, uh, basically if you see the slide, we're going to talk about propellant stimulations, the subtitle multiple radial fractures. So you're going to see and learn about how a propellant can give you multiple fractures, that is the goal, but not all propellant stimulations can do that. It has to have the right burn rate. So we'll describe that. Gas generating, well all propellants do generate gas, that's how you build up pressure in the well bore, but progressively burning. That's something unique to the gas gun and I want to be sure you understand what that means and why we're proud of that particular technology. Basically what I want to cover, and I want to do this so that it's, a, it's, it's an educational, yeah and by the way there is a bunch of brochures in front of you. This one here is the one for the gas gun. My new colleague came up with a little tagline, simply groundbreaking, which we kind of like. But there's some information in here and we have a website, it's just thegasgun.com. There's also price lists and a couple articles in there. But what I want to cover, a basic understanding, and I don't want to insult anybody, but I do want to lay some groundwork of what it is we do to a well bore when we hydraulically fracture the well in a very simplistic way. Explosives, now by that I mean high explosives, can, can create a very different, we can, we can pressurize a well bore lots of different ways. Explosives have been used, they still are used to some extent, like in Pennsylvania where they still do nitro shots, strictly open hole applications. And then propellants, and what are the differences? And how do they load the well bore differently? What are, what are the effects of those three basic ways of loading the well bore? Then I want to very briefly, I don't have time to go into the Sandia tests at great length, but there were some experiments conducted back in the 70s comparing explosives, uh, propellants, uh, and hydraulic fracturing and they were done at the Nevada test site uh, underground so they were full-scale experiments where you actually dug out the results and physically looked at the fractures. It was a marvelous set of experiments and I wish I had more time to talk about them. But they were very revealing as to the behavior of fracturing in terms of propellants, hydraulic fracturing, where the fractures went, what kind of shapes. After all, we, we have all these logs and we can just look down this little hole and try to surmise. Maybe we can run a video camera, but you never get the benefit of actually seeing what happens out into the formation. And then I want to be specific about the gas gun, what we mean by progressive burning, because that's a very important concept that was actually uh, derived from the Sandia test many years ago. How you feel it, what are the benefits, prices. And I won't have time to do much in the way of case studies, but if you go to our website, there's a lot of field results there, so you can have uh, you know, you've got a particular formation, a location, you can see if there's some results on our website that match those particular applications. Now I want to spend some time on this one. Basically, as I said, you can load a well bore in lots of different ways. And the, most, the most common that we're used to thinking of is a hydraulic fracture. And you can put these all on a pressure time chart in a logarithmic way. Hydraulic fracture, you're going to be put, building up a few thousands of PSI over periods of like hours. So on a pressure time scale, and it's a quasi-static process. And the other extreme, high explosives, by that I mean nitroglycerin, dynamite, comp C4, a high explosive that actually detonates at the sound speed of the material. We're talking a supersonic process, shock waves, inertial effects, and so on. These kinds of processes will build up millions of PSI over a period of microseconds. You get a very different fracturing, in fact you don't typically even get fracturing, you get compressive crushing of the rock. In between, we can use propellants to load the rock in a very wide range of pressure rates. Propellants come in all shapes and sizes. You might be familiar with the, the space shuttle, it has solid propellant rocket boosters. A solid propellant rocket motor will burn over a period of minutes. You also have propellants that are used in large bore military guns, howitzers, battleships, tanks. Those are not explosives, they're propellants. And they burn over millisecond time frames rather than minutes. So there's a wide range of propellant pressurization rates. You need to be in the right window of pressurization rate to get multiple fractures. I stress that because there are some propellant tools on the market today that are rocket motors that take seconds to burn. They will not produce multiple fractures. You'll get a single hydraulic-like fracture that follows the path of least resistance. There are some, ours, as well as stem gun and stress frac. 
that do have the right burn rates to produce multiple fractures. We're talking pressures of a few tens of thousands of PSI, and it depends on the depth. It can be as little as maybe 5,000, as much as 50,000 PSI pressures. Time frames, 10, 20 milliseconds. Now that still seems very fast to us. It still seems instantaneous. You know, you think of a, of a rifle or a, a howitzer going off, that still seems like an explosive to us. But in the time frames we're talking, 10 milliseconds is 10,000 times slower than a high explosive. And it's about 10,000 times faster than hydraulic fracturing. So on that, in that respect, it is a very different time frame. And the results, the resulting behavior to the rock are night and day. These are three very distinct regimes. Let's talk hydraulic fracturing. Simple process, relatively. We're, we're now looking down the borehole. We're going to look down the borehole. We've sliced the borehole. We have stresses. Let's assume we're more than 1,000 feet deep so that we're going to get a vertical hydraulic fracture. We have some states of stress in the rock. I've arbitrarily selected 2,000 coming from east-west and 1,000 PSI coming from north-south. And I'm going to pressurize the borehole with a fluid, statically. Before I put any pressure on that, in that borehole, this little element here, I can do a little stress analysis, that little element will have 1,000 PSI of compression on it. The other, well, the other little element here will have 5,000 because it is actually aligned more with this maximum stress. This is the minimum in situ stress. You've heard people talk about that. Which way is this hydraulic fracture ultimately going to grow? Perpendicular to the least principal stress. So it should grow this way. The stress analysis will bear that out because what happens when we hydraulically fracture a rock is we split it in tension. So it starts off at 1,000 in compression, 5,000 in compression. I pressurize the borehole. Each PSI of pressure reduces the, the compressive stress by the same amount at these little elements. So when that pressure reaches 1,000 PSI, this little box now has gone zero. There's neither compressive or tensile stress on it. One PSI above 1,000, and this goes into tension, and it takes very little tension to fracture rocks. That's why concrete, for example, is always used in compression. You don't use it in tension. And where it's in tension, you put rebar. So you get above 1,000 PSI, enough to actually reach the tensile strength of the rock, and it fractures. And it will continue to fracture in that plane, because this piece element never went into tension. When I got to 1,000 PSI, it was instilled in compression by 4,000 PSI. So the fracture grows and continues to grow perpendicular to the least principal stress. Now that's very symptomatic. Now let's slice this and look at it in the other direction. I've drilled the, drilled the well. I've got, I put perforations in here and I fracture this and I get a vertical fracture. And if you're Halliburton, you draw little pictures like that. Why? Because that's where the oil is. <laughs> that's where the fracture is supposed to stay, right? But we know that doesn't always happen. It does sometimes happen, and it will happen if you remember the fracture was growing against that 1,000 PSI, it takes the path of least resistance, go perpendicular to that least principal stress. Well, that least principal stress varies with depth. If you're lucky enough, that 1,000 PSI might be in your oil bearing rock, and your cap rock and your basement may be higher stressed, and they will confine the fracture. But that's not always the case, and in fact, it's probably rarely the case. What if I had that situation? What if the stress was lower? Well, not too surprising, the fracture is going to grow down. It's going to follow because it has time, it's a static process has time to follow the path of least resistance, the fracture will grow where the stress is less. And if that's where water is, you've just made a water well. And we've all experienced that. I know, for example, the Arbuckle Dolomite in Kansas sits right on top of the ocean. And if you frack it, you get the water every time. OK, let's go to the other extreme. Let's go to the other extreme of an explosive. This is a very complicated process. Because it is so rapid now, there are inertial effects. The actual mass of the rock pushes back in the microsecond time frame that explosives 
uh, burn. So you can't simply apply pressure and then reduce this stress. In fact, it goes up. The more pressure you put in, the more compressive stress uh, the borehole sees until it finally just crushes the rock and compacts it. And you actually will get an enlarged borehole frequently. Sometimes this material will slough into the hole in an open hole and you can spend a week cleaning out the borehole. But there's typically a, a zone of crushed compacted rock uh, out here that has actually got less permeability than it had to begin with because it's taken up the pore space. And we've seen that in direct experiments. There's even this, this stress cage. If it sloughs into the well bore and you, and you spend a week cleaning it out, then you may be fortunate, but you rarely see very much in the way of fractures. And that was proven out in those tests at Sandia. Now let's go in between. Let's go back to the pressurization event where I can apply the pressure slow enough to avoid those inertial effects, but rapidly enough to actually overpower the states of stress. If I'm going to put a propellant in here, in particular a gas gun, and I build up pressure very rapidly, once I hit 1,000 psi, I can fracture the rock in that direction, tensile fracture. This is not so rapid now that I have inertial effects getting in my way. But I'm continuing to build up pressure because I've got this propellant that continues to generate gas, and this fracture can't take all the energy. So eventually I get to 5,000 psi, 6,000 psi, and I can fracture now the rock in the unfavorable direction against the maximum principal stress. And if I can continue to build up pressure into the 10, 20, 30,000 psi range, I can get fractures to grow off angle as well. And it takes the right burn rate. I don't want to uh, stress that too much, but there are propellant products on the market today that don't burn rapidly enough. They're rocket motors and they will produce a single hydraulic fracture that will grow up, down, sideways, whichever way a hydraulic fracture will go. Any questions there? That's the basis for using propellants and why you want to use them. This, this radial fracture pattern that you get, let me show you a cutaway. It, these, these fractures are vertical fractures that radiate out into the formation. There's very little vertical growth above and below the top and bottom of the tool. If I have 10 feet of perforated zone and I shoot a 10 foot gas gun, my fracture heights will be roughly 10 feet. They don't grow up or down. There has no time for them to do that. That's the advantage. And the other nice advantage is that it's so rapid that I don't have to set packers. If I have a zone that's opened up below or one above, there's no, you don't have to set a packer to isolate the zone as you would in a hydraulic fracture. The speed of the process takes care of that for you. We only need about a 300 foot column of water on top of the gas gun to tamp the charge. Because of the speed, 20 milliseconds, you don't ha that 300 foot column of water is like a freight train. It's that, there's so much mass in that that you just can't move it very far in 20 milliseconds. So a 300 foot column of water above the tool will contain 98.5% of the energy to the formation. The same thing that isolates it there also isolates it from other perforated intervals that might be below you. So if I have three or four perforated intervals and I want to stimulate two of them, put a gas gun across those perforated intervals and stimulate just that rock. I mentioned the Arbuckle Dolomite. We do a lot of work up there. They shoot the gas gun in the Arbuckle to create the fracture pattern that stays in the formation. And then they'll put acid away, goes in on vacuum, etches out the fractures. I'll go through these tests at Sandia rather quickly. Uh, this is back in the 70s, and uh, uh, I want to run through these quickly, but I do want you to get at least the, imp the, the knowledge of the fact that, that various concepts of explosives and propellants were tested in this wonderful geophysical uh, exp uh, experiment at the Nevada test site, where they used to do the underground nuclear tests. Uh, they spent a lot of time in the G tunnel in Nevada wearing a film badge, it was kind of fascinating. This little mining machine that would dig through the earth. This is not an oil reservoir, but the formation is, was very porous. We had like 20 to 30% porosities, but very low permeability, like less than a millidarcy. So, uh, you know, it had some characteristics of, a, of an oil field reservoir rock. There was a mine 
this, this was a main tunnel, a mine over here, and we were drilling horizontal holes into the side of the tunnel and putting in gas gun. There, was a, there is still a propellant tool known as stress frack. We used high explosives and we used a rocket motor. And then we did these experiments. We, we uh, tested the permeability of each borehole before and after each shot. We injected uh, liquids, a dyed uh, water to test the formation because it didn't have, a, didn't have a reservoir pressure so we couldn't do a drawdown buildup test. And then we actually went through that mining machine and dug it out and physically looked at the fractures. So very quickly, this was an explosive. We wanted to, to check what uh, our theory is about high explosives. The main reason for doing this, by the way, initially had nothing to do with oil and gas. Sandia National Lab's responsibility was testing of underground nuclear weapons. I was brought to Sandy in 1972 to help them understand under what conditions a nuclear weapon going off underground could actually produce a fracture that would run to the Earth's surface and vent radioactive gas. Not a good thing to have happen. This was a high explosive, actually Comp C4. When it was shot, then we dug out the hole. The, hole, the borehole was actually enlarged. It was originally six inches. It was now seven or eight inches in diameter. There was rubble in it. The permeability after the shot was four times less than it was before the shot. In other words, it could take water at a rate four times slower than before we, quote, stimulated it. Not a very successful stimulation. There were no fractures that we could find around that borehole whatsoever. And this is a high plastic explosive, Comp C4. The idea of actually stimulating a reservoir with a nuclear device was actually thought of some years ago, and it's a really stupid idea, and they even, they even tried it. The <laughs> gas buggy up and, yeah, 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 it's just what you want to pump radioactive natural gas into your house. Great, good idea. Uh, that, then we also tested a rocket motor. Now we've got a propellant that takes a few seconds to burn. Uh, this was a, a company called Dynafrac that was using that concept back then. When we mined it out, we actually were digging along and we didn't see a fracture, didn't see a fracture, and all of a sudden this fracture appeared and it looks really huge, but uh, it's deceiving because the fracture is actually in the plane of the wall here. We get to this point and a bunch of rock fell on us. This is the fracture face. It's purple because of the dyed water that was used in the, in the experiment uh, to test permeability. So this fracture looks fairly large, it wandered, but it was a single hydraulic-like fracture. The permeability was enhanced, I think, by a factor of seven. There's also a tool that's used uh, called stress frack. It's actually potassium perchlorate. It's what we call a regressively burning propellant. It's similar to what's used today in, in the stim gun, which is also potassium perchlorate. Uh, in their defense, the, the stress frack tool was made, was advanced, and so is the stim gun over what was fielded back in the 70s but it at least has the right burn rate to create multiple fractures. When we dug that out, um, it did produce some fractures. You see a few of them there. This is a six inch diameter hole, so the fracture lengths are on the order of six, to six inches to a foot long. But it had the right burn rate to produce the multiple fractures that, that weren't aligned with the least principal stress. That rocket motor, that, that fracture was aligned perpendicular to the least principal stress. Then there was a propellant tool. It wasn't called the gas gun then, but that's what we modeled it after. It has a lot of progressively burning propellant grains. Uh, and the photograph doesn't really do it justice. Uh, here's the borehole here. This fracture, I know, in fact, it even intersected this instrumentation hole because it unloaded a big plug of grout. It went about 25 feet in that direction. I think it was about 22 that way. We followed a fracture into the floor, couldn't find the end of it. It went up into the ceiling and then lots of little side, side channels as well. Close up of that. Now that borehole looks rather distorted, but it's not. It's actually because the camera is taking it this way and the borehole is going that way. It's a nice clean borehole. There was no, no rubble left in the borehole, but you get an idea of the fracture patterns. The uh, geologist that was there on site drew a little schematic to uh, basically uh, what her depiction of a typical because we had 20 feet that we stimulated and we dug back through, took maps, dug back through, took maps. This is basically her depiction of what those fractures look like. So that's what the gas gun is based on. 
basically, the permeabilities that were measured before and after each shot, as I mentioned, the explosive reduced the ability of that formation to take fluid by a factor of four. The rocket motor increased it by a factor of seven. Uh, stress frack was run twice. The stress frack people said, well, it's actually best if you shoot it three times. So we tried it. We tried one where we shot it once, and we tried it once where we shot it three times. There was no difference. The two fracture patterns looked identical. And basically the research says that what happens is the, the, the first shot, and people ask me, you know, well, if I shoot a gas gun, what if I shoot a second gas gun on the same spot? I don't recommend it because I don't think you're going to get any enhanced fracturing. Most of the energy from the first shot is lost because most of the energy goes to inflating the fractures. And then they close. And if I put another gas gun or another stress frack air, I simply reinflate the same fractures and I don't advance them. So that's, that was borne out by this. Now this isn't, well this is a big number, an increase of 1800. That's not to say I'm going to take a well from one barrel a day to 1800 barrels a day. Those are really just quantitative or they're, they're uh, qualitative uh, values of how much fracturing was done in these, two, in these uh, five cases. Okay. Next part, I want to tell you about the specifics of the gas gun and progressive burning. And why do I show you a howitzer? Howitzers and ballistic experts years ago, <coughs> they use a propellant to throw bullets out of barrels. And ballistic experts found ways to get maximum muzzle velocity by producing something called progressive burning. Back in, in Revolutionary War days, the, the the, the cannons on a battleship you know, were short, stubby things because they used black powder, pff, poof, gone. You want to get the propellant to burn slower so you can get the bullet moving down the barrel. But what you'd also like, as you can imagine, as the bullet moves down this barrel, I would like to have a propellant that burns faster and faster as the bullet moves. That way I can keep up with the gas volume that's being created. I, I, wanted to, I don't want it to, to burn so rapidly at first that I blow up the gun. So I want it to start slowly, but as it moves, I want to keep up with that bullet. So some ballistic experts came up with an idea for what's called progressive burning. If propellants are a burning process, the speed of the burn front, and this is like in inches per millisecond, is dependent on the pressure, and it's exponential with pressure. So the more confining pressure, the faster it burns. But that's the actual speed of the burn th front through the material in inches per millisecond. As a solid cylinder of propellant is consumed, it gets smaller. If the pressure is constant, what happens to the rate of generation of volume, of gas volume? Goes up or down? Goes down. Surface area is decreasing. If the burn rate through the material is constant, the ability to create gas um, decreases in time. That is, as that's consumed, uh, volume generation decreases. So that's exactly not what you want if you want to throw a bullet out of a barrel at maximum muzzle velocity. I want to, I want to get it burning faster as it goes. So somebody thought, well, what happens if I put a hole in it? This, by the way, is regressive burning propellant. It regresses in terms of volume. And stress frack and stim gun are regressively burning propellants. If I put a hole in my propellant, I can then get it to burn from the inside out as well as the outside in. And if you actually do the math, you find that the surface area in this case is exactly constant. The loss of surface area on the outside is exactly matched by the increase in surface area on the inside. Neutrally burning propellant. At a constant pressure, the generation of gas takes place at a constant rate. If one hole is good, more holes are better. So we have multi-perforated propellant grains that are used in all large bore military ammunition, battleships, howitzers, and so on. As, as that consumes itself, the surface area goes up, and their generation of gas increases in time. What's good for throwing bullets out of barrels also works very nicely for making fractures in reservoirs. Because I can get those fractures started at a lower pressure, but now as gas volumes begin to increase, or the crack volumes begin to increase, I need to save energy and burn my propellant faster late in time. So in fact, we have used military grade um, propellants that are used in howitzers, and we also have an army ammunition plant that has designed propellants to our specifications, and our propellants, that's exactly what they look like. 
can't tell you the exact ingredients or I'd have to kill you all. But that's, that's the nature of the beast and the progressive burning nature of gas gun propellant is what we're especially proud of. That's where the Sandy experiments led us to this, uh, to this formulation. A little demonstration of the gas gun uh, and the progressive burning nature, it was sort of a serendipity thing. We were first, oh, about 10 years ago, we're shipping this material to Croatia. We have a Croatian distributor in Europe. And when we first shipped it there, they were unfamiliar with this particular hazard class, and the Croatian government said, well, what happens if it ignites on the surface? And I said, well, if you just burn it, it'll burn. It needs to be confined to, quote, explode. It doesn't technically detonate. But to burn rapidly, it needs to be confined in a well or in a gun. Well, they said, well, then let's confine it. I'm not sure why they said that, because that's not the way you ship it. If they're worried about hazards uh, in shipping, then light one on fire. You'll see that it burns, but it just, and it burns rapidly, but it doesn't explode. Anyway, for, as an experiment, they went to a quarry. This was back when we actually had the propellant in an expendable tube, a rubber tube. We now have it in a retrievable so that you don't leave debris in the well. This left a fair bit of debris. But about oh, five or six years ago, we came up with a new design that eliminated that. But in this case, we had this, uh, it was actually a half meter long uh, gas gun put into this canister here that had some holes in it and confined. What you'll see, and I'll run this little video, you'll see two events. The initial event is the dead cord, the, the, the blasting cap or the detonator, and the dead cord going off. You'll see that puff. Then it gets the propellant ignited, and you'll see the progressive burning nature of the propellant. Did you see the pressure sort of build up in the in the late time late time blast? as it goes out. It sort of demonstrates that progressive nature. We didn't, it was kind of serendipity, we never thought about actually running a test like that, but just that has sort of, uh, that, that sort of demonstration has sort of, uh, I think, helped to, to demonstrate at least what, what this progressive burning is all about. I'll run it once more. Confinement. Burn rate of a propellant is pressure sensitive. This takes about two seconds here. If it didn't have any confinement, it would simply burn. It would take almost 10 seconds to consume itself. Put it in a well, put it in a cannon, 20 milliseconds. Same amount of energy is released a lot faster because you're building up back pressure. And the pressure increases the burn rate. Uh, these are basically the specifications. We have uh, the main tool that we use is the 3 and 3 eighths tool that's used in 4 and a half inch casing or larger. A few markets we're using now, we're coming out with a 4 inch tool uh, that has almost twice the gas gun power. Um, lengths of 1 to 10 feet. The carriers themselves, it's a steel carrier that has propellant cartridges in it. It's loaded with a debt cord and a, and, a, and a detonator. Little plastic port plugs that go in. When the propellant goes off, the, the port plugs blow out and uh, basically disintegrate, and then the carrier is pulled back out of the hole. Uh, maximum temperature, 280F. That can be a limitation in, in deeper wells. We're working on a high temperature formulation. 4,000 psi static hydrostatic is our maximum. More than that, and these little port plugs will actually uh, uh, extrude into the, into the gun and actually leak the gun. So that's why the fluid tamp of 8,000 feet is kind of the maximum because of that 4,000 psi maximum hydrostatic pressure. And like I say, you, it's in one foot increments. You can shoot, we've shot one foot guns, 10 foot guns. If you have more than 10 feet to shoot, we generally make multiple trips. You can screw the guns together, but when you screw two 10 foot guns together, the weight 
the amount of energy, this is not popcorn, folks. This is a lot of energy that we're releasing. And if you release 20 feet of gas gun in a 20-foot tool, there can be so much kick that the weight of the gun as it comes back down is very likely to pull out of the rope socket. So we typically restrict it to 10 feet at a time. They run very quickly. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we've shot 100, 200 feet in a single well and do it in a day. Typically run on wireline, although they are tubing conveyed in a few applications, we can do horizontal stimulations as well. So it's just, it's, it's designed, if I go back, the, the end caps and whatnot look very much like a perforating gun. It's, it's in fact, the top sub is, is, a, uh, is a standard uh, top sub that goes to the quick change in color locators of a perforating gun. I'll show you this one real quickly. Before we had the steel gun, we actually had a rubber gun. And we would tell people that, that as you set the gun off, all of the perforation tunnels, they wondered, you know, it's not dropping balls or not isolating. How does all the perforation tunnels get gas? And I said, it's the dynamics of it. It's rapid. And they believe me or not believe me, but this is proof. But when you had the rubber gun, it would go down in the hole. You'd set it off. Frequently, we wouldn't get it back. It was debris left in the well and go back. But this particular well, they wanted to clean it out. And they got this almost entire rubber gun back out. And what do you see in there? Those holes weren't in there when it went down. Every, and you can even see there's a perforation hole here, here, and here. What happened is like a balloon. When that propellant went off, it expanded the balloon to the side of the casing, and every place there was a perforation hole is a hole in the rubber. So every perforation tunnel obviously got gas. Direct evidence of that. What it can do for you, obviously you can remove skin. And almost every, you know, when I first went into this, I thought, well, open holes are going to be better than cased holes because I don't have the casing to deal with. Our actual success rate, I believe, is higher in cased holes. Why? Well, cased holes are perforated. That's an explosive. That's a high explosive. It's a shaped charge. Perforation tunnels are damaged by the high, the, the high explosive. You have compacted, crushed rock right at the worst possible place where you want fluid entry into your borehole. Well, we can certainly break through that damage of the perforators, but also damage from cement, drilling fines, all kinds of things damage wells. Even though we can produce fractures 10 to 50 feet, I'll bet 90% of our benefit is in the first couple of feet of, of, of fracturing. Uh, we've already talked about improving the effectiveness of acidizing, how you can run the gas gun first and then you have a fracture network for the acid to be put away. Up in Canada, it's used a lot to propel a wear, prepare a well for hydraulic fracturing because you're already breaking the formation down. I've seen wells that just couldn't be broken down with the hydraulic fracture equipment and so they shoot it with a gas gun and then they do the, do the fracturing and uh, pump pressures are generally dramatically reduced. Uh, injection wells. It's a great tool for injection wells. We, we get sometimes, you know, somebody calls and says, well, we shot the gas gun, we didn't get any increase in production. Well, was there oil there? I don't put oil down the hole, folks. You know, if there, wasn't, if there wasn't a reservoir, if there weren't hydrocarbons in place, I can't help you. I'm going to create fractures. You need oil in place. You need pressure. The reservoir has to have drive. I'm not going to change that equation. I only change the permeability or the, frac the, the conductivity of fluids to the wellbore. In an injection well, we're providing the fluid and we're providing the pressure. If all you need is flow characteristics, I can, I can help there. So we have almost 100% success rate in injection wells, be they water floods. We did a big water flood project in the uh, Bradford Sand in, in uh, New York a few years ago. Uh, waste disposal. We're going to do some gas storage wells next spring. I'm looking forward to that. Because there, there's a lot of damage from the injection withdrawal, injection withdrawal, injection withdrawal cycles. And someone mentioned, oh, he's gone. Stimulating naturally fractured reservoirs. Little little uh, schematic I drew some years ago. If you've got natural fractures, and we know from experience if I drill a well and I happen to hit a fracture, I can drain that fracture, but I can move five feet over, drill a well, and get nothing. The name of the game in naturally fractured reservoirs is try to connect the well board with as many natural fractures as possible. Uh, hydraulic fracture will likely just extend. But if I can get even short fractures going against the grain, then I might be able to drain those reservoirs much more effectively. I'm kind of running over. I've got to wrap things up here. Uh, advantages over hydraulic fracturing. 
we have minimal vertical growth, that is, it is confined because of the speed. It does not follow the path of least resistance. We do get multiple fractures. We know about the situation where a hydraulic fracture can get into water and, and wander out of zone. Uh, no need to bow off, or you know, you're going to get every, every uh, uh, perforation tunnel where you put a gas gun is going to get, get gas and is going to be fractured. So there's no need, no need to set packers, and in fact, we don't want any packers in the well when we shoot this gas gun. In fact, no guarantee if you have a bridge plug that we won't dislodge it. Uh, probably one in 20 get dislodged. The ones that get dislodged in most cases seem to be those that have gas below the packer, below the uh, bridge plug, because there's a place for the, for the bridge plug to move. In most cases, they're, they're there. If you put some in on them or whatnot, they're not budging. But there are a few cases where we have dislodged bridge plugs. Uh, minimal on-site equipment and obviously much lower cost. There was a series of wells uh, in, in Canada that were fractured uh, both with a 10,000 pound frack down below, six of them, and then five with a gas gun and this major producer decided to experiment and did some pressure drawdown tests and compared the skin factor, fracture half lengths, effective permeability and production. The results were so comparable and the ga gas gun treatment was at a fraction of the cost of that, of that 10,000 pound frack treatment that they treated the rest of the wells with the, with the gas gun. But at least it shows the, the basic uh, effects of the two tools. Two, uh. But comparing us to other propellant tools, there are a lot of others out there. Uh, I've mentioned stem gun and stress frack, and at least they do have the right burn rate for multiple fractures. There are some others that I won't mention that are rocket motors that uh, you also lose when you put a rocket motor in the well, the very thing that confines 98.5% of our energy with a 300 foot fluid column. Do the same calculation if your tool burns for a second. You lose over half the energy up the hole. And in the Sandy experiments, we cheated and we, put, we blanked it off. So there was no energy loss from that rocket motor. So get what you pay for. Uh, so we have the correct burn rate, obviously, for multiple fractures. We put a lot more energy in the hole than either stress frack or stem gun because we're not sharing the borehole with a perforating gun. Yes, the stem gun has the sleeve that will do the perforating and the stimulating all in one trip. That's their advantage. But their disadvantage is that you're sharing that real estate uh, with the perforating gun. So they have a sleeve. It's potassium perchlorate, which is a powder. They have to mix it with epoxy. It's 60% epoxy. It's only 40% active ingredients. So not only do you have less volume, you have less active material. We have, a, we have on the order of five to six times more energy in our small gun uh, for the same size, uh, same length tool as in, the, as in the stem gun. Progressive burning, we, we feel that the Sandia test back in the 70s dramatically demonstrated the benefits of progressive burning. And it's the same, same process that throws bullets out of barrels and obviously the independent research. And now who does the tools? In the U.S., these are the wire lines that field the, the, the tool for us, and this family of wire line companies is growing pretty rapidly. Case studies, I'm not going to bother with these because you've got lots of them on the website. Lots of examples, different kinds of tools, I, different kinds of formations. They'll be before, after, what kind of production. This is all just production results in various kinds of formations. Sandstone, limestone, dolomite, chur, chalk, you name it, we've shot it. So you can just uh, go through those. And I also have, for anybody interested, I have a series of printed field results with me. And anybody that takes the time to come up and talk to me afterwards, I'll give you that same information on a two, two gigabyte um, uh, flash drive. So those are the, and we've shot, obviously, uh, there's a coal well, so we've got gas wells as well as oil wells. We just, um, just had one a couple of weeks ago up in Kansas that was a, it was fun because it was just a little four-foot gas gun, gas well that looked good in a Mississippi at about 4,000 feet, and no gas, no gas, perforated, reperforated, ran acid, four-foot gas gun. The customer called me; they got six million cubic feet of gas. Those are those are the fun customers to talk to. So anyway, you look through those at your length, at your leisure, uh, both in the printed formation on the website, and come up and get a flash drive. And the website is thegasgun.com. Any other questions? 
hopefully you've learned something and learned maybe where some of, the, uh, some of this technology can help you out. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>